good, af good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, pleasure to be here uh, and, and talk in this important, very important and very impressive uh, conference. I've learned uh, so much over the last uh, two days al already. So I was asked to speak about um, some work we did for the International Space Exploration Coordination Group, ISEG. Uh, I, I hope many of you are familiar with ISEG. Um, um, I mean, ISEG is a, a voluntary collaboration of all the world space agencies, and it's, it's a fantastic thing. It's, it's not yet a world space agency, which I, I, I'm thinking of um, a, a talk we had on Monday. I mean, I think that would be a very desirable thing. It's a long way away, but perhaps ISEG is still a foundation on which we can build a global space exploration. Uh, well, it already has a global space exploration strategy, but maybe there's a nascent uh, institution there that could be helpful in the future. Anyway, a few years ago, we were asked to produce a report on um, scientific um, uh, opportunities for human exploration beyond Earth orbit. And the scientific opportunities for human exploration beyond Earth orbit are enormous. Um, so I'm here in this session to talk about the conclusions we came to on human robotic synergies. They too will be important. I will give some examples. But I hope, I hope you recognize also this picture. This is Jack Schmidt at the Apollo 17 landing site in uh, Nine Taurus Littero Valley in December 1972. Uh, I think the scientific um, legacy of Apollo is often neglected. And one of the things that Apollo, I mean, we're still mining this legacy today, literally and figuratively, because we're still studying the samples. Um, but I think it's often forgotten just how productive, how efficient the Apollo astronauts were in, in their exploration. For all the reasons that Arnold gave earlier in his, his excellent talk, at the, uh, early, humans on site, humans able to make in situ decisions, humans being able to think on their feet, all of Apollo benefited from all of that, and I've no doubt that the more people we have back on the moon and the more people we have on Mars, the more science is going to get done uh, that won't get done otherwise. Having said all of that, of course, there are places in the solar system that humans can't go to, like the surface of Venus or probably Europa's ocean, and so there will always be a scope for robotic exploration as well, and on places like the moon and Mars, there will obviously be scope for human robotic synergies. So one example that interests me quite a lot in lunar exploration is accessing outcrops of, uh, of uh, rocks on steep slopes or in subterranean uh, areas where uh, it may be difficult or dangerous or perhaps impossible for astronauts to, to visit, but where nevertheless there is a rich scientific record. Uh, that, uh, that we would like to access. So the image on the left shows these layers of lava flows exposed on this steep wall of a, um, um, a crater on the moon, and the picture at lower left shows a, a one of these collapsed pits, probably a collapsed um, lava tube, uh, which would itself be very interesting to explore. But here I show this image because it re the lava flow stratigraphy in, um, in the basaltic lava flows is well exposed where the surface has collapsed. Now, all of these layers uh, were once exposed on the surface of the moon, and they've been covered up by later layers, which means sandwiched in these layers there are ancient lunar surfaces, ancient lunar soils, I'll call them paleoregoliths. And these paleoregoliths will have um, retained a record of everything that happened to the moon at the time when they were, when each individual layer was on the surface. Uh, a record of the activity of the sun through the solar wind, the galaxy through galactic cosmic rays, the micrometeorite flux. There's a tremendous temp, there's the stratigraphy of, of lunar lava flows has this rich scientific record, but difficult to access. So probably astronauts are not going to abseil down these cliffs taking samples, uh, but a rover or a robot would. This is the Axel rover from the NASA's moon diver concept. And I don't know whether you can see its rope, but here it is being abseiled down uh, to making samples of this, of this uh, cliff face. But uh, the point I want to make is there will be a rich scientific record in these deposits. They'll probably be difficult for humans to access directly. It's important that we do access them. And so this is an example of human robotic um, synergies in lunar exploration. 
Um, now, I, I, I'm, I'm glad to follow the, the previous talk on uh, drilling, because drilling is also a very important activity for scientific exploration, certainly on Mars, as we heard, but also on the Moon, in part because there are buried deposits on the Moon that will contain a rich scientific record that we might like to access, uh, but which are not exposed in outcrops at the surface. So if they're not exposed in outcrops of the surface, we'd have to drill down to them. Now, I have here a little personal anecdote. So in, in 2016, ESA put forward a call for new scientific ideas. And myself and colleagues proposed uh, accessing subsurface regoliths. You recognize this picture of one of these collapsed pits. Um, to, to access the past history of the galaxy by accessing a temporal record of the cosmic ray flux that's been striking the moon over time. And this came, and, 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 but, but this, this went to ESA's science directorate and, the, um, and therefore it wasn't to involve humans. So if I may just make an aside, I think this artificial distinction between human and robotic exploration is not helpful because exploration is part of science and vice versa. I mean, it's a scientific record we're trying to access in these deposits, but it will require human exploration to access. So anyway, we weren't allowed to have humans in this loop. We had to propose a robotic drill uh, to sample quite deep, tens of meters, much deeper than anything that's been attempted yet. Uh, and bring these samples to the surface and then extract interesting components of the buried layers and then bring them all back to Earth robotically. And our colleagues at Astrium designed a mission for us. And then this came back from the ESA technical reviewers and basically uh, the, the argument was this is impossible to do robotically, <laughs> um, which I, I, we kind of knew. <laughs> This is an example where you would need humans in the loop, but because it was a call from the science director, right? <laughs> anyway, so it came back, we can't do it robotically. Arguably, it could be done with humans, and here's a NASA graphic showing some humans accessing uh, or maintaining a drill. You just know if you set something like this up, it, certainly if it's gonna access tens of meters, it's going to go wrong. In situ problem solving is going to be required, as our Lord said, uh, you know, Having humans will be very enabling to, to, act to, to um, maintain this exploration technology, but it is a scientific record that we're trying to access. It's not just exploration for its own sake, it's to access a scientific record. In our case, the history of the solar system's location in the galaxy. Um, anyway, but there is, there is, a, there is a, an intermediate... Um, um, it's not either, needn't be an either purely robotic mission, which is probably impossible for the, something on the scale we were envisaging. It would be greatly enabled by humans. But the ESA technical reviewers did come back in their helpful feedback and said, well, perhaps this is an, an area where tele-robotics would be helpful. Maybe you don't actually need the humans here, although I, I do think they would be helpful. But if the humans were on in the loop are operating this drill tele-robotically, and yes, that is indeed a valid point, and so space agencies are investigating. I think we have a talk on telerobotics later. Um, in, in ESA, there was this METERON program, multi-purpose end-to-end robotic operation network. My understanding is that's now been subsumed into the Terra Novae um, expert program. Uh, here's the ESA astronaut, Andres Morgensen, operating this rover in, uh, at ESTEC. And yes, there is no doubt that this is a way of bringing humans, for places on the moon or Mars or elsewhere in the solar system that it really is infeasible to send humans. Having humans um, operating ro robots, tele-robotically, will be very enabling. Of course, the latency is important. You have to minimize this. You might just get away with direct tele-robotic operation of rovers or, or, or instruments on the moon from the Earth. I think Soviets did say with the lunar hods, just. Um, but still, you've still got a few seconds latency, which is not helpful. Certainly for two operations on Mars, then a latency of 20 minutes one way is going to be infeasible. So having astronauts, even teleoperating uh, tele robots, at least in the local vicinity of the teleoperated activity would be helpful, which on the moon would be oper tele-robotic operation from the gateway would be an example, um, or from a lunar outpost. Similar arguments would apply to Mars. Um, Human-assisted sample return, so this is just my last example, 
Um, uh, the, Issa did a while ago have this concept called Heracles. My understanding is Heracles has now been discontinued. But I think the, um, the architecture envisaged here it was potentially a very um, a good example of human-robotic synergies. The idea was that um, a robotic lander with an ascent, this was sample, human-assisted sample return, so this would show ESA's EL3 lander, now Argonaut, carrying an upper stage to, to, to take samples that had been collected on the surface. The upper stage would obviously be ro 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 an, autom an automated vehicle. The idea is it would dock with the gateway, here it is captured by the camera arm, <laughs> uh, and then the samples would come back in, um, in an Orion capsule. Um, there is a concern here about just what NASA's mass budget is for these return samples in Orion. Um, I, I mean, Apollo 17 brought back 110 kilograms, and, this, and Orion is a much bigger vehicle. So, so, so if the sample return capacity isn't in the 100 kilogram range, I think we'll be disappointed. But, but there is here an opportunity for ESA, perhaps, as, uh, as um, Samantha Cristoforetti said um, yesterday, uh, ESA are investigating the possibility of, of an autonomous sample return from Earth orbit and then later from the gateway. So here is a way of, 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 you, of, of having sample return benefit from a human, a human spaceflight architecture, where you could set the, the, the advantage of having the robotic sample collection is you could collect samples from locations where the humans are not operating. For the foreseeable future, the humans are likely to be operating at the south pole of the moon. That's a very interesting geological environment. But there are other places on the moon from which we need samples. So by, by leveraging the, um, the Artemis gateway type architecture, having robots land on places of the moon where the astronauts are not operating, but then have the samples brought back to the gateway so that hopefully they can be cached in a vehicle which can collect a large mass of samples, perhaps from many different places, um, and then have these returned to the Earth would be a very, also a very enabling architecture scientifically that would benefit from human robotic synergies. So anyway, this is my last slide. I see Stefan's on his feet already. <laughs> uh, here's, a, here's the document. You can find this online in the, uh, on the ISEG website. Um, but as regards human robotic synergies, this is the conclusion we came to. And basically, it's that we're going to need these. They're going to be very enabling on the moon. They're going to be very enabling for solar system, for exploring the Mar Mars and other places in the solar system. But the moon is the place to test them. Because the moon is our next exploration objective, we're going to have people there soon again, hopefully. We'll have robots there. We probably have teleoperated experiments. So the moon is the place to demonstrate this, this, this capability for human robotic um, synergies, which will then be of great use for exploring other places in the solar system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian.